In this video, I'm gonna help you with required practical six. If you're in year 12 or year 13, we have to revise the required practicals, right? And this practical is all about culturing microorganisms using aseptic techniques. So let's go through some of those key aseptic techniques. First of all, what does it mean, right? Aseptic techniques is when you're culturing bacteria. You've probably all done this practical by now, but you're culturing bacteria and preventing contamination by making sure you're working in a sterile environment because you want to grow or culture one strain of bacteria, maybe E. coli, you do not want to contaminate your culture with other bacteria from the environment. And equally, you don't want to contaminate the environment with the bacteria that you are culturing because that could potentially be harmful. So you want to work in a sterile environment with sterile instruments to prevent any contamination of your culture or equally your environment. So. Let's go through some of the key techniques that you might use. If you've got a liquid culture of bacteria, you're probably gonna use a pipette to take a set volume of that bacteria. Now, in an exam, you'd refer to it as a sterile pipette. It will come in a plastic wrapper. You'll open it only when you need to use it. It will be pre-sterilized. You use it once and then you immediately discard of it into a beaker of disinfectant. Obviously, pipettes are made of plastic, so don't be daft. Don't talk about flaming a pipette in a Bunsen burner flame, because it would melt. Just say use a sterile pipette that's pre-packaged and sterile. If instead of a pipette, you're using like a metal uh, or wire inoculating loop to transfer your bacteria, you can say flame the inoculating loop. So you pass it through a Bunsen burner flame until it glows red. You know that that heat from the flame is gonna kill any bacteria that might already be on that inoculating loop. You can also flame the neck of the bottle. So the bacteria that you're culturing, you're probably transferring it from a little bottle. It's called a McCartney bottle, by the way. You're probably getting it out of this bottle and transferring it onto your Petri dish where you've got your agar jelly. Now, when you're putting your pipette or your inoculating loop into this bottle, there might be some contaminating bacteria on the neck of that bottle. So you can pass the neck of the bottle through a flame to kill any contaminating bacteria that might get onto your pipette or your inoculating loop. Also, the hot air from the Bunsen burner will force any contaminating bacteria away from that open bottle as well. Okay, what else do we need to talk about? Sterile pipette or flame your inoculating loop, flame the neck of the bottle. Oh, you could also say work near to a Bunsen burner. But my advice would be make sure you can explain in your exam why that is helpful, why that's an example of an aseptic technique. If you have a lit, maybe I should just clarify that, a lit Bunsen burner, it creates an upward current of air because hot air rises, right? So hopefully, if you're working close enough to that Bunsen burner, as the hot air rises, it's gonna create that convection current. It's gonna carry up any airborne microorganisms and move them away so airborne microorganisms do not fall on your plate and do not contaminate your culture. Right, we've got four so far. Ooh, boil the agar. Now, agar is a nutrient medium that we put into our Petri dish to grow our bacterial culture on. It contains all of the nutrients that bacteria need to divide, but we do boil it before we pour it into our Petri dish to kill any microorganisms that might be contaminating that agar. Now we're kind of at the point where 
We've got our sample of bacteria. We've got our agar onto our Petri dish. Now we need to actually put the bacteria onto the Petri dish. Now, when you do this, you keep the lid of the Petri dish over the dish at an angle. Does that even make sense to you? As in, you're not gonna take off the lid and just move it away. You're gonna keep the lid over the Petri dish at an angle, so you've got enough space to get the bacteria in, but you're still covering the agar. Again, so airborne microorganisms cannot fall onto your agar and contaminate your culture. So keep it open for as short a time period as possible. You could say that as well. Leave it over, open slightly at an angle. You could say that. Um, yeah, any of those things would be fine. Then you tape the lid on. Once you've transferred your bacteria, tape the lid on. Obviously, if the lid comes off, you could contaminate the environment or contaminate your plate. Do not say seal. Don't say seal with tape because the bacteria do need oxygen in the air for respiration. You don't want to kill the bacteria that you're growing. So just tape it on securely, but do not seal. Um, you're going to incubate it then, right? You're going to incubate and in a school or college, 25 degrees Celsius is the highest temperature you can use for health and safety reasons. If you use 37 degrees like they may do in industry, that could potentially encourage the growth of harmful pathogens, pathogens that are harmful to humans. So in a school environment, 25 degrees is the warmest temperature you can use to incubate your plate. Is there anything that I have, have missed? One piece of apparatus that I've not mentioned. If you're using a glass spreader, and you can let me know if you did in the comments, you might transfer your bacteria and then spread it around with a glass spreader. Obviously that needs to be sterile too. So for this, you could say like dip in ethanol. That's another sterilization technique. Or again, flame the spreader. You might even have done both. You might have dipped it in ethanol to sterilize it and then flamed it as well to further sterilize it. I'm just trying to think of all the equipment and all the different ways to sterilize it here. Obviously, disinfect your work surfaces. Obviously, wash your hands with antibacterial hand wash. These are all really obvious things though, right? The questions are probably gonna be a little bit harder than that. Now, after you've done this practical, you probably took it a step further by also placing onto your Petri dish, like an antibiotic ring. So if I just draw, let me draw you an example so we can just talk about the maths that would be involved. So once you've transferred your bacteria to your Petri dish and you've spread it evenly with a glass spreader, you might place on filter paper discs that are soaked in different antibiotics. Maybe you want to compare the effectiveness of different antibiotics. Maybe they're soaked in disinfectants. I've even seen um, schools do it with different mouthwashes to look at the effects of different mouthwash on bacteria. But when you do this, you're probably going to use tweezers to put those filter paper discs on. Now, tweezers are made of metal, so the best way to sterilise those, again, is to pass them through a Bunsen burner flame. You put your discs onto your agar before you tape it shut, before you incubate it. And when you get your dish back, you may see zones of inhibition. So let's just draw one on. If you see something like this, this is called a zone of inhibition. It's not good enough to just call it a clear area. But where you get a zone of inhibition, that's telling you the bacteria has been killed. So the antibiotic diffused into the agar. It killed all the bacteria in this area. And obviously, the larger the zone of inhibition, the more effective that antibiotic was. If you don't see a zone of inhibition, like here, there's no zone of inhibition, that's telling you that the bacteria 
are resistant to that particular antibiotic, whereas obviously they're susceptible to this one because they were killed by it. Now, obviously, if you're comparing zones of inhibition, it's a circular zone. So you can compare them by calculating the area of that circle. So you'd use the formula pi r squared, measure the diameter, half it to get the radius, square it, multiply it by pi, and then you can compare the areas to see which was really the most effective antibiotic. And I think that is everything. I hope you found this video useful. Make sure that you come back to it. You can watch it again to help you revise. When you come to revising, this is required practical six.